Welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Hector Menendez. Hector uh, is a lecturer at uh, King's College London, um, and his, his area of expertise and interest is in machine learning, cybersecurity, and software testing. He got his PhD from uh, the Autonomous University in Madrid and uh, spent, spent five years um, of postdoc at UCL with um, David Clark and uh, has done a lot of research on evolutionary algorithms and um, their application to testing uh, various types of software, but also to machine learning. Um, thank you very much, Hector, for having joined us today. Uh, before uh, we move on to the talk, I just wanted to say that this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want your name to appear, you could join us as a guest and uh, turn off your camera and things should be fine. Thanks again, Hector, for having accepted our uh, invitation and the floor is yours. Thanks for inviting me and thanks, Mohamed, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Hector and I'm going to talk about the connections of adversarial machine learning and uh, machine learning testing. And basically what I want to start doing is to give you some background about my, myself. So basically I started my PhD in machine learning in 2012 and I then joined, once I finished the PhD in 2014, I joined uh, UCL and I started working in cybersecurity. So you will see this talk has a lot of things related to malware. And a few years later, I working with uh, also David Clark, who was, uh, who was my, my PI during my project in malware analysis, we started working in software testing. And if you see even in my areas, look not very uh, connected between and there are a lot of points in common where I have been working. So, for example, when I have been working with malware and with cybersecurity, I was using machine learning for malware detection. When I have been working with software testing, um, I was also connected with cybersecurity in terms of obfuscation techniques applied for testing or identifying malware triggers using software testing techniques. And then when I was uh, administrator, that was my, my former job, uh, I was thinking, uh, why don't I just join everything together and I just focus on one area that has all the features of all of these. And it's when I started working in testing machine learning. So basically in testing machine learning, what I started focus on was on three main factors. One was testing the functionality of the machine learning algorithm. That is basically what I'm going to talk about in, in this talk and what adversarial machine learning is about. And the other two factors that I'm not mentioning in this talk are testing the performance of the algorithms and testing the security of the algorithms. And actually, I create a tool that is called Mlighter that I will talk about it at the end of the, of the talk that tries to be a holistic overview of this read. But let's think about the functionality. So how do we know that the algorithm is actually doing what we want it to do? Or to be more precise, how do we identify blind spots in what the algorithm is doing, okay? So for that, there is an area of machine learning that is called adversarial machine learning that will try to attack the algorithm until the algorithm is not able to make decisions. Just to give you a small index about what I'm going to talk, I'm going to start a little bit talking about how machine learning works, just to give you some background. Then I'm going to start talking about where we can find vulnerabilities in machine learning algorithms how these vulnerabilities can be exploited, some use cases where these vulnerabilities have been exploited, some of them are actually mine, and um, how we can use this information to actually create a proper testing of a machine learning system, okay? So let's start with a little bit of background. So how machine learning works? Well, for all of you, probably you all know that machine learning is a statistical process. You basically give it some data and the system learns. Depending on the knowledge that you have of the data, you normally have different kinds of algorithm. The more popular are clustering and classification algorithm. In the case of clustering, what you try to do is to group data by similarity. In the case of classification, when you try to do is to do the same, but having some supervised information about the data that has been provided by an expert. So if you have the general structure for a machine learning pipeline, you normally start with training data. I don't know if you can see my mouse, can you? Yep, yes, okay. You, you have some training data that you are going to, to, to use for the training process. 
you extract some features from the data. Normally, you try to reduce the features, so you try to find projections or find some smart ways to make everything a bit more clear for your machine learning algorithm. Then you train the algorithm, okay? And this training process will generate a model. This model is going to be able to, for example, discriminate whether your data is uh, about uh, cancer or a benign tumor, or if your data is about different types of flowers, or if your data is about malware or benignware. So basically what you are creating is a model that will be able to discriminate. Okay, once you have this model, what you're going to do is to test the model. So basically you will give it some input data. Again, you're gonna extract the features. You are gonna ask the model what's the, the outcome of this data. So for example, you have a new piece of software. You want to know if that piece of software is malware. So you're just gonna extract features from the software and just gonna give it to the model. And the model will decide whether that piece of software is malware or not. And it will do it with some specific percentage of error, okay? So just an example of a clustering algorithm. So for example, you can have some data that you are grouping by similarity and what your algorithm is going to try to find is what's the most optimum group depending on the feature you have selected. So imagine that these X's, X1 and X2 are, for example, the size of a software and the number of times that the software is connecting to the network. Okay, and you just have this specific uh, these specific points representing the software that you have, your clustering algorithm will try to identify groups related to the proximity that is called a similarity measure. But it will have no information in principle or about what is malware or what is benignware. In contrast, in the case of classification, you will have a specific classes. So imagine that you have these signals that represent, for example, one represents a noisy radio signal and a clean radio signal. So basically what you are going to do is to find a way to represent it in a space or a feature space like this cube that you have in the right side. And you are going to try to find the discrimination that is this specific wall or a specific line or a plane to be more precise that is separating the space between the two classes. So the blues are in a side of the space and the reds are in the other, okay? And now what we are going to try to do, now that we have a small background about classification, clustering, how machine learning try to create these walls to discriminate data in this feature space, what an adversary is going to do is to try to find ways to jump these walls, try to find ways to take these features that are in one side of the classification and move it to the other is going to try to find it with legal transformations. Meaning that, for example, if you have a piece of software and you add a statement that will never be executed, that will be a legal transformation and that might affect the machine learning classification. Okay? Any question until here? Okay, let's go to the vulnerabilities. So where are the vulnerabilities of a machine learning algorithm? Let's go back to the pipeline. So we can have vulnerabilities in the training data. For example, you can have a poison, poisoning inputs that has been introduced maliciously in your training data, and they are going to affect the performance of your algorithm. And also you can have vulnerabilities related to privacy. This is something that happened to one of the keywords from Google. Uh, imagine that I just, you take my phone, okay? You just go to any of my apps, and you start writing something like, I live in, and then you let the autocomplete to give you my address. Sometimes uh, they are trying to fix it now, but a few months ago, the autocomplete will give the full address that uh, you have if you normally, for example, have gatherings with your friends and you have sent them your address often. And that's actually a problem with the algorithms uh, because this will be, a, a, a violation of privacy. You can also have uh, vulnerabilities in terms of the feature space. For example, you can have attacks that are focused on specific features or removing specific features to make sure that if I have malware and I know that one of the features is related to the malicious behavior of my software, I want to remove that feature. I want to make sure that 
they are not using that feature in the classification. If I have control on the feature space, I can actually make sure that I'm not, uh, I'm not identified just by creating like this kind of mess between the features that increase false positives. And last but not least, this is uh, the same with the feature selection, sorry. And last but not least, you can directly attack the model. So how do you do that? So basically the model normally gives you a probability of being classified in a specific class. So for example, in the case of malware or benignware, you have a probability of being malware. If I have access to that probability, I can just start to modify my malware uh, just to reduce the probability, making sure that I'm not changing the semantics. So we'll see a little bit more about this. And with that, I will reduce the capabilities of malware identification. I will create malicious variants that will be able to cheat the algorithm. And if you actually want to retrain your system with this new variant, it's very likely that you will start increasing the false positives because retraining is not always the solution. It helps, but if you have an adversary that knows what they are doing, it won't be a solution. So you will eliminate the capabilities of the system of identifying your kind of malware if you have access to this. Okay, but how? How these vulnerabilities are actually spread? How do we do all these steps? So for this, we need to think about the, the parts of the process. So normally, there are three main agents in a machine learning system. One is the oracle. The oracle is the expert. It's the person who decides this is a flower, this is this kind of flower, this is cancer, this is malware, etc. Then we have the features, the feature space. So we check, for example, the size of a program, we check the petal of a flower, we check the size of a tumor, cells, etc. These features are actually the place where we are going to be moving, where we are going to be applying our transformations. And finally, you have an algorithm. And the algorithm also use gradient extending or it use different options like different kinds of search or Monte Carlo methods in order to separate the, the data and find these planes. So if you also know how this system works and how they are vulnerable, you can also attack them. Let's have a look and I want your collaboration on this one. Maybe you can just open your microphone and tell me. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I forgot just one small slide. This work actually because machine learning has an assumption that is not necessarily true. You assume that the trained data and the test data follow the same distribution. And when you have an adversary, that's not necessarily true. The adversary will try to change the new data to make sure that the distribution is different to the test data. And that is gonna be actually the point of the attack. That is gonna meet, make the attack uh, feasible, okay? So, for example, imagine that I'm trying to attack the oracle and you, you are the oracle. So imagine that I asked you the following question. What's the color of this dress? What would you say? You can open your microphone if you want. So could, could you elaborate the question a little bit more? We, we are the oracle and we want to give you an answer. Yeah, and I would to, to tell minimize you. the possibility of what kind of attack? Yeah, so my question is, just give me the answer to this question. What's the color of this dress? So regardless of attack, just an honest answer? Or yeah, just an honest answer. Blue. Blue? Anyone else? I think I've, I've seen this question before. And like it's 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 um it's a funny question because people report different colors in fact uh, for this particular dress. Yeah. Uh, so let uh, let me call it uh, pink. Pink. Okay. So what about now? It's the same dress, but what's the color now? Yeah, I, I think I retain my hypothesis. I, I see there is a bit of pinky thing, so like to me it's still pink. That's all right. Okay, I can see that some people are writing. I have the chat here, blue, blue, blue and black, the same, also blue, okay. And now? Uh, 
<laughs> Three different colors for me. Pale blue. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, for me actually there are different colors. So at the right side I see blue and brown, and in the left side I see white and gold. But you can see that probably is the same for us. The only thing that changed was the light. The light changed the color, obviously, and also we as humans normally, th this was actually a big argument at some point, we as humans normally have different perceptions of things. If you are actually trying to tell uh, whether a piece of software is malicious or not, um, you might consider, for example, that Facebook is malicious because it's taking data from people, or you might consider that Kasperi, the antivirus that, um, that comes from Russia, might not be so malicious, but the, but the British government considers as a malicious software. So if the Oracle, if the people who have to make the decisions on what is malware and what is benignware cannot actually find an agreement because it's kind of easy to cheat us or because we don't have the standards and it's not so straightforward to make a decision, you can imagine that that will be a vulnerability when we need to try to uh, to attack an algorithm that is learning from the data that we are providing. So this happened a lot in, the, in terms of fairness. That's actually one of the problems, the biases that we already have are affecting the algorithms and the algorithms are repeating behaviors that we have as humans in terms of fairness. And they are being as, how can I say, limited as we are or we have been with the data that we had generated. So this is one point, how to cheat the Oracle. Now let's think about the future space. So in this case, you have, mm, let's say, malware and benignware, okay? And you know some features of the benignware. So what you're gonna do is to try to make your malware look more similar to the benignware. You don't need to do it exactly the same, you just need to do it similar in terms of the similarity measures that you think the algorithm is doing, is using. So you just need to start applying transformation to make it more similar or to be close enough to that similarity. So let me just show you a small example. So imagine that we have these three points, okay? These three black points, and this space is a space of similarity. So basically, if I in here, my similarity is lower than if I in here, okay? We don't need to reach the points, but we need to reach a neighborhood of the points in order to be considered very similar. And we just have this piece of malware, this red point right here, that is the malware that we are going to modify with semantic equivalent transformations. So what we are going to start doing is to follow this specific mountain of similarities using a gradient descendant that will be guiding the transformations that we are doing. We just start transforming the malware with semantic equivalent transformations until we reach a neighborhood of the benign web. We don't need to reach all of them, we just need to reach one of them, and it's very likely that once we go to any machine learning system, we are going to be misclassified if we are similar in the future space. Okay? That will be how you cheat just by using the future space. And at the same time, you can cheat the classifier, as we said at the beginning, we can just jam the world. So for that, you are gonna analyze what's the classification probability. For example, imagine that the pink area is malware and the blue area is benignware. So you just select one of the pink elements and you are gonna apply the same strategy. You are gonna apply a gradient descendant or a genetic algorithm or any kind of search to your specific piece of software, and by applying this transformation and guiding the search, you are going to start finding a path from malware to benignware. And once you reach the final point, your classification will be successfully evaded, and your piece of software will be considered benignware. So one of the things that we need to ask ourselves is what the adversary knows about our system. Does the adversary know what training data was used? Does the adversary know what features set, what the features were used during the 
process of selecting the, the different characteristics of the software or, or the data that we are using. Does the adversary know which the specific classifier was used? So depending on this, you have different scenarios and different levels of knowledge that you normally test in adversarial machine learning. And my favorite one is this one that you see right here, where the adversary knows nothing, because this one is the, more, the most interesting one. This one is called actually the level zero. You only know the final decision of the oracle. You only have access to that, and you don't receive any other feedback. Just malware or binware, period. Then you start knowing a little bit more. So for example, the most common scenario is you have access to the classifier or to the final model, and it gives you a notion of probability. So it tells you you are malware with 80% of probability, or you are this malware family, or you have a 90% of probability of having a cancer, or you are this kind of flower with this specific probability. Then you can know the features page. You can know which features have been used to make the decision and how in that information you know what you need to modify in your software in order to evade the machine learning classification, in order to evade the detection system. And if you have the training data, you're in a very good position if you are the adversary because you can replicate absolutely everything. You can just create your own variants locally and then you can attack the system. And actually this is very useful because variants can be transferred. Meaning that if I have 10 different classifiers that has been trained with the same data or with similar data, I can create my own classifier with the same data and I can transfer a successful variant in my classifier to the others. And this is something that was discovered a few years ago in, in one of the Usenix um, conferences in Usenix Security by a group that has been dedicated for uh, to adversarial machine learning for ages that is led by Batista Vigio in, in the University of Calabria. And this was like a mind blow because it's like, okay, so my algorithm is not only vulnerable, but if someone creates an algorithm that is kind of similar to mine or a model that is kind of similar to mine, and he finds a vulnerability, that vulnerability will transfer to my model. So it's very discouraging. And it's something that is relevant to test. So how does this work in practice? Let's see a couple of use cases. Uh, unfortunately, all of them are going to be in the intense of malware because it was my, my research area for a very long time. So I hope you don't mind. But let's see three cases. So the first one is called Evade ML. That was the inspiration for my work for a very long time. And then two cases that I designed. One is called Triple E, and the other one is Jago Droid. Uh, Triple E is for uh, Windows malware, and Jago Droid is for Android malware. So Evade ML was designed for PDF malware. So basically, it was trying to defeat two PDF malware detectors. And what it's doing is that it's applying genetic programming to generate variants that are going to try to defeat the detectors. In which scenario this work? Well, it has all the information. So basically it has information about the features that were used, has information about the data, and it has information about which classifier was used to train the models. Okay. So basically this is the pipeline that was used for HTML. You start with a set of malicious samples. Okay. I don't know if you are familiar with genetic algorithms, but basically this is the standard genetic algorithm. You have some malicious samples that create a population. And in this population is where you're going to start playing. Then you have your target classifier and you have a specific oracle. The oracle is going to check that your piece of software is still malicious. And the target classifier is what you are going to attack. Based on the attack, you have a fitness function based on the probability of being identified as a malicious software. If you have evaded the classifier, you have a successful variant. So that's it. Nothing else to worry about. If you haven't, you check whether you have reached the maximum number of generations. And otherwise, if you have reached it, you actually finish, obviously. Otherwise, you select the variants depending on which one has been more successful or have a lower probability of being identified as malware with respect to the previous generation. You create mutations. Okay. These mutations use some benign samples. 
because you're trying to be more benign. So you're going to inject benign code in your malicious samples. And you just create a new population with that. And you keep going with this process until you generate successful variants. And the question is, how this actually work in terms of the PDF? So basically what you are doing is just injecting some code inside of the body of the PDF that is not really going to use to be used. It's only going to be there for uh, cheating the classification process. Because in the same way that machine learning is learning in a way that is a bit blind, you can actually play with those features in order to move your malware in the feature space. The same strategy that I was talking about when I was talking about the grid, and you remember this line. So this is exactly what we are doing here. And then we can see the results. If we check the accuracy, the original accuracy, it was like 99% for one of the classifier, 99.96% for the other classifier with very low false positives. But then when the adversary came, the adversary reached 100% or one rate of false positives, which is the maximum possible rate. So basically, just by adding this process of constantly finding intelli intelligent ways to inject benign code to the PDFs, you were able to evade the machine learning classification. Why is that? Because the new data is not following the same distribution as the trained data. And that's the reason you can evade it. And these are blind spots. This is something that you need to identify because the malicious behavior is still there. And the PDF malware is still behaving as it used to behave at the beginning. So that's why it's so relevant to find these samples and to avoid them. The second case that I've been working on was, uh, well, I, I didn't work in EvadeML, but EvadeML inspired this one, is uh, Tripoli. So basically, when once you have malware, there's a process that is called packing that you just take the piece of software, the binary file, you reduce it like a compression, and you have some available space. And what we did was to inject control entropy regions, because we thought that entropy was actually having a very relevant, um, a very relevant part of the decision making of the antivirus and different machine learning systems. So basically what we did is just to start injecting this control entropy regions, and we attack two things. We, for one, on one side, we attack different classifiers that were using binary information from malware to decide whether the malware was actually malicious or not, and we also attack real antiviruses. When we were attacking the real antiviruses, we didn't have any information apart of malware or not malware. And even in that case, even if we were in level zero knowledge, we were able to reduce the detection of the malware just by injecting control entropy regions that were doing nothing to the malware semantics. So if you see the what we would call the, win, the, the entropy profile, you can see, for example, this original piece of software. And we just did very small modifications on the entropy of the file. So this line that you see is the entropy per chunk. And these small modifications that you see here is the small entropy that we just injected, OK? So you can see that the majority of the file is very similar. And how do we inject it? Well, we just use a small Gaussian kernels that were deciding with a genetic algorithm, we're deciding what was the best place to inject the small entropy regions. And basically, when we compress during the packing process, we have a lot of available space. So that allows us to play a lot with the different variations. So this is the, the structure. So basically, we just create a small uh, genetic algorithm that was doing the injections, making decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And when we test it with different methods from the state of the art with different classifiers, you can see the original false negatives that was very low. It was the blue, um, the blue square. And the false negative after we injected after we applied our technique, and you can see how it, re it raised in terms of avoid ev creating ev evasive variants that were successful. And if you see how much effort it takes per classifier, it's very interesting because the genetic algorithm after the eighth generation of the search process, 
was able to defeat absolutely every single classifier. So this is the line of probability where you have malware benignware. So once it passed the line, it stopped making any effort. And you can see that in the first generation, in the first four generation, a lot of them were defeated. And in the eighth, basically all of them were defeated. So the effort is not very high. Uh, let me just skip this bit. And then we transferred this knowledge to antiviruses to check whether we were able to defeat real antiviruses. And you can see that we passed from an original detection rate of more or less 50% of the malware to an about 19% of the detection. So the same technique that was affecting the, the, the classifiers, the machine learning classifier was also affecting the antiviruses with the difference that in the case of the antiviruses, we had no idea what the virus is doing to detect the malware. So let me just skip this bit because it will be a bit too long. And the last one that we created was called Jacodrate. And this one was applied for a Android malware detection. So basically, what Jacodrate is trying to do is to change the family of the malware. And that will affect to the triage process of malware analysis. And we are only going to focus on the feature space. So if you are familiar with the triage process of malware analysis, normally you have automatic analysis, that is the antivirus that you have in your system. If they had doubts about a piece of software, they do a static analysis. If they still have doubts about the piece of software, they run the software, which is kind of expensive compared with static analysis because you need to leave the software running for a few minutes in order to have some features that might be relevant with respect to the malicious behavior. And if you don't get anything from that, you go to reverse engineering. So if you have a new piece of software and you think that it's going to be identified, when you don't want to do is to have it in hands of the reverse engineering team because they will be, uh, they will be able to figure out other indicators of compromise. So normally what you try to do is to make sure that you are not passing from the static properties and you will pass if you belong to some specific malware families. So that's the reason we are trying to make sure that we can move between the classification of different families in this case. And we create a very similar pipeline. We just started with different malware families, we extract features, we created the machine learning algorithms, in this case, based on state-of-the-art algorithms. We create a classification model, and then we inject our evolutionary process to evade this classification just by doing some repacking and choosing new features. But in this case, we were a bit more smarter than in the previous work. So let me just give you some background. These were the uh, specific uh, examples of the system that we were focused on attacking. We focused mainly on Rebel Rate, which was one of the most popular systems because it was using a lot of static analysis features. And basically what we did in terms of the families is we tried not only to evade the classification, but we were also trying to find the minimum number of modifications in order to evade the classification. And this is basically what you can find here. So you can see that the average number of modifications was one. In some cases, it was even less than one because it already misclassified, but we only needed to modify one single feature, and actually it's a feature that you see in the right side, in order to evade the classification process. And actually, we found successful variants in the first solution, but not for all the families. Actually, this one, base breeds, was uh, impossible to change. And that's made us thought, oh, wait a minute. So maybe there's something that we cannot do with adversarial machine learning. Maybe there are some limitations. So. Uh, this is just a, a little bit of summary. So then we started to check the transitions between different families. And we started to check which modifications were possible. And we discovered that, yeah, there are modifications that are possible. It's possible to evade the classification. It's possible to move from a family to another, but not to move from any family to any other family. There are limitations and there are cases when you cannot move. There are transitions that are not possible. So the feature space is well defined in a way that we cannot find these transitions. And actually, this is very useful because if we see, for example, this one right here is the one 
one that we cannot move is a base bridge. So we see a variant in this specific family. We might say, okay, I don't trust the classifier because I know I can transit from any family to this other family. But for example, imagine that we have this other variant called FATAC, and we can see that, sorry, this family that is called FATAC, and we can see a variant that, cons that is classified as Great Kung Fu. It's possible that this Great Kung Fu one is a modification of a FATAC one. So I can try to backtrack what's the probability to be classified in this specific class. And with that, I can start constructing a kind of reverse engineering of what the classifier is deciding. Just because there are limits in the transitions that the classifier can do. So now, after all this work, I start working on machine learning testing, as I said at the beginning, and I create this tool called Enlighter. So basically, this is the, the logo. So basically, what Enlighter was trying to do is to try to find all these non functional, um, non functional properties, or, or sorry, functional properties that were actually coming from adversarial machine learning, those modifications. And you can also see that there are other kind of testing that I have, but I'm just going to focus a little bit more on the adversarial machine learning testing part. So basically, a lighter is trying to focus on testing libraries of machine learning that are based on Python or R. OK, sorry, I, there's an ambulance just making some noise behind. And it's giving also a pipeline that is implementing all these algorithms that just generalize for different machine learning pipelines. So using some adversarial testing for, non -fa for functional features, we can identify blind spots in machine learning algorithms. And you also have a nice front end uh, that is trying to make everything a bit more uh, friendly for users. Actually, I can just show you this is the front end. So basically, what you do when you are using a lighter is that you are adding some data. You prepare the specific, uh, the specific data set for training process. Then you upload a model. You start creating a basic variance. And with that, you can start an attack and you can start finding the limitations of the system. So one of the things that we have done with Enlighter, that is actually uh, one of the main goals of the tool, was we discovered several false negatives in different machine learning models that has been used for cancer detection, for malware detection, et cetera, et cetera. So just by modifying features in a way that they are supposed to be modified. And actually, that's good because we can actually apply it for our project with the smart cards. And because Enlighter also have a low level testing, it can also identify crashes in the code that you are using for your machine learning system. And at the moment, we have identified like about 3,000 different types of crashes in Python and our APIs. And it can also identify performance problems. So it's coming now. I mean, it's going to be released in a few weeks. So if any of you want to use it, just let me know. And I just send you the, the link once it's released. It's going to be uh, open access for everyone. So what comes next? So we have a system that can identify these functional limitations and can identify this blind spot. So now what we need to do is to improve the models. Once we identify these robustness problems, we need to make the models more reliable. So we need to find ways to make sure that once we have this blind spot of this limitation, we can improve the model and we can make it more robust. And I don't know how much of this is possible. This is something that is open research. Actually, I think the Mohammed sent a, an email this morning about a talk that is going to be talking about the, the limitations of uh, of several different engineering processes, but among them artificial intelligence, if I remember properly. So it would be a very interesting talk to watch. And then it's interesting also to fix the bugs that we have identified. So for example, if there are low-level bugs, and also to check how our parameters are affecting the performance of the systems. So just to give you a bit more of uh, for reading. So for example, if you want to read about adversarial machine learning in terms of malware, I just have this small a review that is called the, the never ending arms race uh, in malware. You have this really good book that is about machine learning and security that has a lot of information about adversarial machine learning. 
and some of the papers, for example, for Jagodroid, taking on the family for Triple E when we were attacking uh, different antiviruses, uh, sorry, different classification systems, the Unrace and iTech, and also for when we were attacking different antiviruses, the one about the Unrace. That is when we were co-evolving Triple E to attack different antiviral systems. And that's it. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Hector. Uh, we have ample time for discussions. Are there any questions from the audience? I could start with the first question, and I hope so. So it, it, I hope others will join later. Um, you had these two techniques, uh, triple E, and the one before, whose name escaped me. That was great. Uh, yeah. So, so for for example, with the first one, you showed that there is um, one hundred percent probability of evading the the classifier, um, but you didn't specify any budget for for evading the classifier. Uh, have you looked at the uh, amount of effort that you need to evade the classifier? And also, have you compared the two techniques in terms of the amount of effort they require? Uh, uh, triple E. Mm -hmm. So, our budget was, uh, I think, uh, sorry, I, I think I didn't make it very clear. Our budget was the number of generations that the algorithm was using. Um, basically, it wasn't very high. It was uh, with four uh, generations, we were able to evade the classifier, at least generate one solution that was evading. And with eight generations, we were able to generate a whole population that was evading the classifier. And with Jagger it was kind of similar. It was in four or five generations, we were able to evade the classifiers. And it didn't require a lot of effort. It was like, I remember in Jagger we were also measuring queries uh, that we were doing to the antivirus. And I think in about 50 queries, we mm -hmm. were able to generate successful variants. Okay. Uh, I think Simos has a question. Simos, please go ahead. interesting uh, uh talk so can you hear me yeah, yeah. okay good so a uh, quick question just uh, and a clarification so if you i'm just wondering how you managed to to to, to find the um, uh to create that setup for the using the entropy method so what type of uh analysis you did what type of injection you did in order to to create the adversarial uh, to make the transition from a malware to benignware if you so can elaborate a bit on that so basically, normally, uh, antiviruses are based on binary information. They have sequences of engrams, or they have the entropy, or they have different information from the binary itself. Once you pack the binary, okay, mm -hmm. what you do is you compress it. And you leave some space that is not used after that compression because the, the, the size is reduced. So what we did is that we started using that available space to put junk code that was never executed, okay? The, when you, I don't know if you're familiar with packers, but normally when you have a packer, you have a small piece of code that is called the stuff, that the first thing that the stuff is gonna do once the, the, the software is executed, is going to take the compressed information, clean, uh, decompress it in memory, and start running it, okay? So we just had another step to that process that was removing the control entropy regions and then just follow the same process. And with that, uh, we were able to evade the detection of the classifiers, and we were able to evade the detection of the antiviruses. Okay, uh, but just a, a follow-up. So I, I assume by, by, by this process, you were not um, damaging or changing the content of the, of the file? No, we keep the semantics completely unaltered. Actually, we have a dynamic analysis system that was uh, that was used to, to make sure that we are not changing the semantics. And we found a method that was completely safe in those aspects because we are injecting the, the control entropy regions after we compress the file, okay? okay so okay. basically, the file will be decompressed in memory, but before the decompression, the control entropy regions will be removed. All right, and final one on that, so that maybe anyone, someone doesn't want to follow up. So, it, w could this be captured through um, um, like a checksum? Would so, this be would this modification be captured if you were using a checksum, for instance? You mean like checking that the hash is different? Yeah, yeah. Well, you have to consider that malware is normally installed in your system like a new piece of software that you don't know. Uh, that you don't know. So the 
hash change every time that you modify just one single bit. So obviously yeah, adding. So you will be able to, will, will be able to 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 capture that if uh, if you are using a, a sum checking because it will, because that will be a different hash. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it will be a different hash, but because the I mean, if the system is trying to use the hash to identify whether you have malware or not, your antivirus is is mm -hmm. I mean, it's the the worst kind of antivirus possible because yeah. just modifying yeah. a byte will make mm -hmm. your system completely safe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have a, a hypothetical question, uh, which which of course is related to to, to this talk. Uh, uh, thank you very much, by the way, for the for the presentation. And mm -hmm. and yes, I would be uh, very much interested in uh, uh, taking a look at your uh, system uh, when it gets released. Uh, like I think it would be great to, to have the link. So um, the question which I have uh, is uh, basically around the. Um, you know this uh, changing uh, changes to the model uh, that uh, may adversarially be uh, somehow placed into it. So, like, and 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 in a way, I, I wanted to, to 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 somehow like seek your opinion on on this because, like, we have this democracy of sharing machine learning models and. Uh, uh, like sharing tools and like uh, uh, developing a model for this and this and this and then, then posting it online. And of course, if uh, we have these adversarial minded agents uh, who may uh, somehow like place a model with the back door in there uh, and um, like everybody else, uh, like without actually knowing that, uh, that it, it's a corrupted model, um, would uh, would somehow use it and maybe use it as a as a basic uh, initial step and then train it, but presumably those uh, things can survive the training, so the debugs. Uh, so the question to me is this: like, is there a way to test uh, that somebody would have would have already placed the backdoor in an otherwise open source model? What what's your opinion? It's possible. Uh, that people put backdoors uh, is possible to find them. I don't think it's easy to be honest because you will need to put a lot of effort on, on identifying. Um, but okay, it's because I, I see a spectrum of questions in your in your question. So let me just reply first to the backdoor, sure. and then I want to reply sure. to the sharing models. Uh, okay. So okay. even if someone puts a backdoor and you identify it. Uh, in order to fix the vector, I think at this point, either you put another layer on top of the model, so something that just prevents that input to happen or to reach the model, or what you do is uh, you try to retrain the model in order to fix the vector. If you have the data, something that not, doesn't happen so often these days, uh, you can try to do that. If you are using a data-centric AI approach, you can actually just put the layer and try to make sure that it doesn't happen, it doesn't go to the model. The other question that is about related to, to if we should share models, knowing that some might have some backdoors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, if they come from from Facebook, I would be, I wouldn't be so happy to have a model that <laughs> that is trained with data that who knows where they take it from. But uh, even in that case, um, I think this is the same question of open source software. If you have enough time to go to all the code just to make sure that there is no backdoors when you are using an open source software, that would be amazing. But not everyone has the time, and we still share software yes. that's open source. So I think it's important to keep sharing models. And at some point, if there is a backdoor, probably someone will find it. Unfortunately, probably it will be in 10 years, but someone will find it, and we will be able to to fix it or to correct it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Because like. Personally, I'm interested in backdoors uh, which survive training. For example, like yes. suppose that, like, uh, like uh, uh, I don't want to believe it, but suppose that people who created this AlexNet and people use this AlexNet initialized uh, neural networks, suppose that there is a backdoor in there. Now, like, what are they going to do? Like, if if, if if the whole thing survives training, like, how are you going to, you know? So yes. that's yeah, yeah. Have you seen the um, the how they created this Pegasus? Uh, this Pegasus exploit. So basically, it's amazing. I mean, the, for the for the iPhone, uh, for the iOS operating system, what they did is that they found 
in, in, in iMessage, I, I think it's called, uh, they found a vulnerability in the rendering of the images. So they sent an image that was like a PDF, but and it was able to exploit the vulnerability, but because there's a sandbox, they were not able to scale, but they were able to use uh, those like and XOR or etc. So with that, they created a virtualization on top of that. And thanks to that virtualization, they were able to scale. And because they were able to scale, they were able to reach even any politician fault. Wow. And it was like, boom, it was it's unbelievable. So if they can do that, they can create backdoors in machine learning algorithms. I mean, yeah. sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, like and and like in in a way, indeed, that that's a massive research question. I think it's like uh, like you know, it, well, as you said, like it takes at the minute. Uh, I can imagine that uh, it can take exponentially long time uh, to yes. find one. Uh, like the question is, is there a better way, right? Like how how can you? Well, yes, I, yes. I, Sorry for hijacking that. I think that's work in progress. I think actually that's the point of of doing research. No, is to try to find the better ways. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Ivan. Thank you very much. Other questions? Are there any other questions? OK, if there are no further questions, once again, thank you very much, Hector. Uh, in two weeks time, we will have a Natarajan Shankar. Unfortunately, we couldn't have him last time around, but this time uh, we will uh, do our best and we have sent uh, reminders and we are, we are uh, making sure that we will have him this time. Uh, and he will be talking about uh, using natural language uh, in uh, verification of autonomous systems. So it's a very exciting talk and I hope to have you all uh, there in two weeks. Thank you again. Thank you for being here and see you in two weeks.